And welcome to Humanist Canada's webinar series. I'm Anna Popovich, Program Director with Humanist Canada. And as always, your, your host this afternoon, you're attending in listen-only mode. Today's webinar will be 90 minutes in length, a 60-minute presentation by our panelists, followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. Our topic today is a one-school system in Ontario, and we are joined by two guests. Elvin Tedhall was a leadership candidate in the 2020 Ontario Liberal Party election and the first ever Liberal candidate to propose merging the public and Catholic school boards across the province. Elvin's proposal was supported by two public polls that saw a majority of Ontarians agree with him. He also proposed introducing a basic income and expanding childcare. Elvin had uh, previously served as vice president of the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care. He is also the founder of Canadian for Paternity Leave, a coalition that successfully pressured the federal government to increase paternity leave for Canadians. Ellen was director of government relations at Sheridan College and senior policy advisor to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. He currently works as a senior manager at Ryerson. Um, thank you and uh, welcome. Thanks, we're, also, we're also joined by Leonard Bach. Uh, Leonard is president of One School System. He was born and raised in Nova Scotia. In 1986, he moved to Ontario to attend university and has worked as a software developer in Ottawa since 1991. Appalled at what he saw as the discrimination and waste in our school system, Leonard and two other parents incorporated OneSchoolSystem.org in 2004 to lobby for change. Welcome, Leonard and Elvin, and thank you for joining us. And uh, over to you, Leonard. Uh, so my name is Leonard Bach. Thank you for the introduction, Anna. Uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, I'll have to whip through these slides. I have quite a few slides to present. Uh, so I'll go at a fairly fast pace and, uh, and then we can have maybe questions in the uh, period after. Uh, so um, so we're, we're a, um, we incorporated in 2004 as a human rights and education advocacy group. And our goal is pretty simple. It's to seek one a single secular school system for each official language in Ontario. That's one French school system, one um, English school system with uh, that, that's sectarian in nature. And, and the reason for these goals is to ensure a better stewardship of the financial resources committed to the education of Ontario's children uh, and the waste and to end discrimination in admissions and hiring. Um, we're an education, um, uh, human rights organization, education advocacy group. That was our purpose when we incorporated. Uh, we want to see better stewardship of uh, end of the waste and of the discrimination. I already said that. So, uh, so our school system was born out of 19th century realities. Ontario in the 19th century was pretty much homogeneously Christian. It was uh, you're either Catholic or you're Protestant, and uh, neither group had a whole lot of tolerance for the other. So this intolerance uh, that they didn't want to be taught by each other's teachers from each other's scriptures led to the establishment of separate schools beginning in 1841. There were a series of acts leading up to Confederation that were eventually, uh, you know, the rights at the time of Confederation were enshrined in the, Confeder in, in the Constitution. So that's what we have today. But, you know, the um, one thing I want you to take away from this is that when this was established, it was not to confer any sort of privilege on the Catholic minority in Ontario. And that Catholic minority, as we'll see later, has evolved into, you know, the largest single religious group in the province by a wide margin now. And they are not disadvantaged or persecuted in any way. You know, the original rationale for this divided school system in the 19th century does not exist today. So, um, yeah, I pretty much said that here, repeated that here, but this is uh, how it's changed since Confederation is in Confederation, Ontario was 17% Catholic, 82% Protestant. We are much more diverse today. And uh, again, as I said, you know, the Catholics may have at one time been a minority that was suffering uh, discrimination, but today they are arguably the least in need of any sort of protection. They are the largest religious group in the province by a wide margin, and any sort of intolerance that might have existed then does not exist now. <clears throat> One of the aspects of the discrimination that we uh, we find appalling, and I think a lot of people find appalling, is that all Ontarians bear the same tax burden based on their income, not their faith. But if you're a Catholic Ontarian, you may have 
if you're a French Catholic Unitarian, you may have up to four school systems to choose from. Whereas if you're an Anglophone non-Catholic, you have one. You're only guaranteed one school, one school where to choose from. So there's a real inequity in choice here. <clears throat> um, that uh, you know, inequity is exacerbated by the fact that Catholic school boards up until grade nine have an absolute right to reject non-Catholic children. And it's typically only in areas where there's declining enrollment where Catholic school, elementary schools um, will open up enrollment to non-Catholics because uh, fully enrolled schools are more cost effective to run than um, half empty schools. So they, uh, they have uh, no hesitation to, uh, to draw away uh, non-Catholic students where uh, it can be a financial advantage to themselves. Uh, high schools are supposed to be open access, grade 9 to 12, and in most cases they are, but we have heard cases over the years uh, where they try to suggest to parents when, when they're full uh, that uh, they may have to put on a waiting list. And, you know, I know I've told parents in my own community that there's no waiting list at grade 9 to 12. You have every right to attend the same as a Catholic. You're just trying to dissuade you from trying. <clears throat> Another big aspect of the discrimination in our school system is in hiring. Uh, Catholic school boards have an absolute right at all grade levels to discriminate against non-Catholic teachers. Um, this wasn't supposed to be the case when um, uh, public funding was extended to Catholic high schools in the 1980s. Uh, they were uh, given the right then to allow uh, to discriminate against uh, non-Catholic teachers for the first 10 years of full funding for Catholic high schools. But in 1996, when that 10 years expired, um, Ontario Catholic school boards told their member boards uh, to ignore the law and to continue to discriminate in favor of Catholic teachers. And that the government at the time, the Harris government at the time, took them to court, lost. And um, now we have the situation today where uh, these school boards are continuing to discriminate against non-Catholic teachers. But this, uh, this inequity is quite severe because Catholic schools make up about a third of Ontario schools which essentially means that non-Catholic teachers enjoy 50% more job opportunities than the non, their Catholic teachers enjoy 50% more job opportunities than the non-Catholic counterparts. Um, where you do see non-Catholic teachers, which are very rare, my little picture of a Sasquatch there, something very rare in a, um, in a Catholic school, um, they're in, in, ineligible for a permanent position or for promotion. Uh, I have spoken to some and they are desperate to get out. They want to get to a true, truly public school where they can actually have a career and some advancement opportunity. Desperation, and I, I know a, a former coworker of mine recently, uh, her daughter graduated from teacher's college and uh, after a couple of years of unemployment in desperation converted to Catholicism. This happens as well, is you see teachers in Ontario converting to Catholicism in desperation to get a job as it, it does open up more job opportunities for them. Uh, the discrimination in our schools has been condemned at least a couple of times, you know, in 99 and 2005. Um, both times our government uh, brushed off and ignored the condemnation. The uh, religious division in our school system um, also lead to a degree of racial and ethnic segregation. Um, if you look at census data in Canada, you'll see that of a dozen or so minorities at the census tracts, there's only two Latin Americans and Filipinos that are more likely to be Catholic than, than non-Catholic. And the rest are more likely to be non-Catholic. Non so what that means is in the Catholic, the, the Catholic school system's a wider school system. And what diversity they do have is a different diversity than the public system, because most of the visible minorities are more likely to be non-Catholic. <clears throat> So this, um, this division too, is it, it, it prevents our, our schools from accurately reflecting the diversity of our communities. So uh, this is an, another unfortunate consequence of the Catholic schools. This is a rather recent too. This article was from, uh, when was this from? So last year or two, I think, that uh, only 8.3% of the students in English Catholic school boards are non-Catholic versus 70% of Ontarians in general. And that is heavily skewed to the high school level where they're not allowed to discriminate in grades nine to 12. So of course, uh, you know, all these overlapping school systems bring with them inefficiencies. And quite often, uh, uh, you know, over the years as our counterparts or our, our, our opponents in the Catholic school system for opposing the, the push to one school system, uh, will claim that there are no big cost advantages to, uh, to going to one school system. But 
that is um, easily rebutted just by using the Ministry of Education's own funding figures, uh, which show that the smaller the school board and the more geographically dispersed their schools and students, the higher the funding. So what you have in Ontario is, is Catholic schools, on the English side, Catholic schools typically get more money than um, public schools. And on the French side, where uh, French Ontarians are mostly Catholic, the Catholic school system is larger on the French side, is the public school system. The French public school system gets more money than the French Catholic school system. Uh, the ministry is basically acknowledging right there in the funding formula that these smaller school boards cannot realize the same economies and efficiencies as their larger counterparts in the same area. Uh, in Ontario, you also have waste every year with um, advertising. You know, Catholic school boards advertise every single year in, um, in various forms to, uh, to encourage Roman Catholics to identify themselves as Catholic school supporters. Uh, but this ultimately has no effect whatsoever on the total funding they receive. And they acknowledge this. Like here's a quote from one of their advertisements. Um, this is from the Ottawa Catholic School Board, but I've seen the same ad used by other school boards in Ontario that, uh, it, that making this designation has no financial benefit to the Catholic School Board. It's political. You know, the rationale for doing so is political. It's to create the impression that there's this voting block, which there isn't, because there are a lot of people in the Catholic school system that support the idea of one school system uh, that might intimidate politicians. So they want as many people as possible to sign up as, as uh, Catholic school supporters. They spend money every year to try to encourage people to sign up as Catholic school supporters, but ultimately has no effect on the funding that their school board receives. It's a bureaucratic sleight of hand. And what it does succeed in doing is it, it creates a false impression amongst the public at large that Catholics pay for Catholic schools. Again, uh, you know, Catholic Ontarians bear no higher taxes than anyone else, but they get um, two for one or a four for one deal uh, where they get more choice for the same taxes. <clears throat> um, yeah, where you have areas of declining enrollment, um, another example, um, of the, uh, the consequences of, of this is uh, uh, you'll get uh, recruitment campaigns. And I remember reading one year that the Toronto Catholic School Board spent $750,000 in a single year advertising to draw students away from their coterminous public board to fill their half empty schools because full schools are more cost effective to run than half empty schools. So, you know, most, their preference is not to have non Catholics in the schools. But if they need to for financial reasons, uh, for if it, if it gives a financial benefit to their Catholic students, they do open the doors at the elementary level. But what happens sometimes is when they do this, when they fund these advertising campaigns, is the public school board, in order to not have the Catholic school board effectively transfer their declining enrollment or their low enrollment problem onto the public board, they'll have a counter campaign. Well, they'll advertise uh, in opposition to the advertising the Catholic school board is doing. And then you have both boards that are wasting money on this advertising. Uh, you wouldn't have this under one school system. This is it's just a waste of scarce education resources. So, you know, how much money would we need to offer the same quality of ed education under one school system? It's clearly less. You know, is that uh, we would not have the lower student density school boards that we have now if we weren't dividing communities all over the province into Catholic and non-Catholic. At one point in the uh, Liberal government's time in office up until 2018 when they lost, off, lost uh, government is uh, surplus pupil places in Ontario had ballooned to more than 400,000. And the education minister at the time suggested that that costed about a billion dollars a year. I've, I've seen estimates that are higher than that too. So they had a moratorium on closures leading up to the 2018 election, but they did acknowledge that there was gonna have to be an initiative to reduce the overcapacity because it, it cost a ton of money. Um, you know, the tragedy is, is when you do re, re, um, reduce that overcapacity is, unless we merge the school systems at the same time, is um, some communities are gonna lose schools. Because, you know, if you have, let's say the point of minimum viability of an elementary school is about 100 kids. Well, if you've only got, um, you know, 150 kids of elementary school age in a community, and you divide them into public and Catholic, then that community may get no school. You know, you may end up busing all the kids in that community to another school. Whereas if you had one school system, you would be guaranteed that that community would keep at least one viable school. <clears throat> so 
So what closures are going to mean, what they have meant for, for communities, and I can give one example here in Ottawa. Uh, there's a small community uh, called Munster, not far from where I live, and they had a public elementary school. The Catholic kids were always bused out of that community. There was never a Catholic elementary school in that community. But a few years ago, their public elementary school closed as well. So now all of the kids in that community are bused somewhere else to go to school. Uh, it's a rural community, so it's, uh, they're bused a fair distance. And there are communities like that around Ontario where you have a community that has no school, but could have one if we weren't dividing the kids along religious lines. <clears throat> and when there is a school closure, it can disproportionately affect non-Catholic families. Uh, because when a Catholic school closes, their, their students, uh, you know, Catholic students can still attend the public school. Public schools don't discriminate, but the reverse is not always true. So non-Catholics are more likely to need transport to a new school farther from their home following a school closure. Um, this pre-pandemic, uh, this is right from the Ontario, um, Ontario School Board, no, no, the Ontario Busing, is it, what's the name of the organization? It's a busing organization, Ontario School Bus Association. Um, from their website, 830,000 kids are bused to school in Ontario every day. Hundreds of thousands of those are bused past their nearest publicly funded school to attend another one farther away. You know, part of my bio is supplied to uh, Diana before the talk here today was uh, I talked about the experience of my own kids. I live in Stittsville, Ontario, which is a suburb of Ottawa, and it's a community of 30,000 people. I've been here for 25 years. We still do not have a public high school. We have a Catholic high school that opened up about 10 or 15 years ago now. Um, it's within walking distance of my home. So, you know, if we had one school system, my kids would have walked to and from high school. But instead, they were bused 80 minutes a day to Richmond, a community uh, outside of my own, uh, to go to the public high school there. And kids in Richmond were bused to my community. And this is a scenario that unfolds in places around Ontario too, where you have rather large communities. Like we're, I'm in a community of 30,000 people, but we have no public high school. Uh, and our kids are bused, you know, um, I did a calculation that, uh, you know, over four years of high school, which is 40 months, uh, they spent the equivalent of 43 days riding buses. Uh, completely needlessly when they could have been get, getting exercise walking to and from a school uh, not that far from my house. So, you know, I've got some, um, I got a spreadsheet of data under Freedom of Information Act uh, access request a few years ago in Ontario. And there are lots of communities like ours where you have, uh, you know, kids that are bused long distances to go to high school, where if we weren't dividing kids along religious lines, we could have those kids in that community go to a school in their own community and walk there. <clears throat> okay, let's see. And of course, walking has got health and environmental benefits. <clears throat> okay, and, and uh, you know, one thing uh, I've experienced over the years too is the brush up, you know, from politicians who. Uh, Whenever you raise this issue, they'll brush you off. And, you know, since 2007, they'll say this was settled in 2007, but it, it certainly was not. You know, those of you who've been in Ontario for a few years, you remember that election. You remember the issue of that election was John Tory's promise to give other face what the Roman Catholics had, which is full funding for their religious schools. And that's what the public massively rejected. Uh, they didn't reject the idea of one school system because it's never been put to them. <clears throat> but there it has been clear support shown over the years for the idea. You know, a majority from a slight majority, depending on the poll over the years and depending on the question, a slight to a very significant majority of Ontarians favor one school system. I'm not gonna go too much into depth at this in this because I know Alvin's gonna um, show a poll that goes into quite a bit of detail. Here's the most recent one I have. He's got some newer ones uh, that shows that it doesn't even matter the political strife. The support for one school system is strong across the spectrum. Even Catholic parents, Catholic school parents, the majority of them support the idea of one school system. So a lot of the arguments we've heard over the years are, you know, we have French schools, so why not Catholic schools? Um, the answer to that question is offering a religious school system to one sect of one faith exclusively uh, when there's no objective justification for doing so is a human rights violation. And it's a human rights violation under any of the uh, international human rights um, uh, treaties or 
uh, that we're a part of, that we're, we're a party to in Canada. Um, it is not a human rights violation to offer education in your official languages. But as well too is uh, an impractical uh, point, point is uh, uh, removing public school rights or uh, Catholic school rights in Ontario is politically much more doable than removing French school rights because French school rights apply countrywide and you need a majority of provinces with a majority of the population to agree to that. Um, Quebec and uh, Newfoundland both got rid of Catholic schools. They both had higher Catholic populations than we do. But um, because of education is an area of, of provincial responsibility, only the province, the requesting province in Ottawa need to agree. So it's a much easier bar to clear in terms of getting change than it would be to remove French language schools. But again, French language schools, the big, biggest reason is that we have them and we don't have Catholic schools is, you know, justification for them is, is that it's not, it, it's, a, it's perfectly legitimate to offer um, education in your official languages. Uh, it is not legitimate to have what we have in Ontario, which is effectively uh, a preferred or official religion. So, you know, I just spoke about this. They, you hear too, it's our constitutional right and the constitution can't easily be changed. It can be. It can easily be changed in the case of um, denominational school rights. And it has been in provinces that are more Catholic than Ontario. But another thing too is, uh, you know, when we talk about discrimination, uh, people will inevitably say, well, anyone can go there or teach there. I know a non-Catholic child or a non-Catholic teacher. And, and, you know, when I've pressed these people over the years to name them, they won't. You know, I, I have encountered the odd, uh, as, I, as I alluded to earlier, the odd uh, non-Catholic teacher in a Catholic school, but they're not happy to be there. They're there because they're desperate for a teaching job to get a position, but they would rather have one in a truly public school board where they can actually get promoted and advance and have a, have a career. Uh, they can't do that in the Catholic school. <clears throat> and you hear as well is that um, one of the biggest reasons I hear to oppose um, Catholic, uh, eliminating the Catholic school system is that they're better. And I would say if that was true, it's, it's uh, simply another facet of the discrimination that's reprehensible. That if you are a member of a certain sect of a certain faith, that you should have access to better schools. But I want to say though that uh, you know I think there's plenty of evidence out there that this is simply untrue. Um, if you look at the EQAO data, uh, which is the standardized testing data collected every year, is Catholic school boards might score a point or two higher in in English or in math than their local public board counterparts. But if you look a few pages into those reports, is they have contextual data, which are supposed to allow you to, to uh, compare apples to apples. And they show that you know, the, um, the, the truly public boards have a, a higher percentage of Eng English language learners, people who are born outside of the country, or otherwise have some sort of um, characteristic that may you know, pose a challenge. That, uh, the, that the more native born kids in the Catholic school system don't have. <clears throat> but I wanna go to uh, tell you too, but some consequences you may not be aware of. I wasn't aware when I first started of some of the consequences of, of our, our school system, the status quo. And one of the most significant and important ones I think for Ontario kids, and it doesn't matter whether they're in the public or the Catholic school system is the consequence in terms of choice. Um, by dividing our kids along religious lines and communities across this provinces, you often end up with a situation like you do in the city of Renfrew, which is west of Ottawa, where they have a public and a Catholic high school, but each is only about 500 students. So what this means is that school cannot realize the critical mass to offer the same sort of course selection as you can find in larger centers where you have high schools that have 1,000 or 2,000 students. And that has a dramatic effect on the choice that's available to those students. It's harmful to students in both boards, you know, the public board and the Catholic board. And this is particularly harmful at the high school level because this is when they're starting to try and focus on their career interest and their, their preparation for post-secondary. So one, uh, to, to put this in, uh, you know, to really put a punctuation mark on this, uh, here's an example from Ottawa, uh, where a few years ago in 2017, uh, Rideau and Gloucester public high schools were combined. They were both very low enrollment and this was having that sort of consequence I'm talking about where it had a huge consequence in choice for the students. Not to mention both schools were grossly under-enrolled and under-enrolled schools cost more to run. So when they combined those two schools, the predecessor schools had um, course catalogs of 166 and 135 respective, 
respectively, where the new one had 219 courses uh, that the students could choose from. So, you know, a question I have here is, you know, if, if, these, if this was a public and a Catholic high school in a community like Renfrew, they probably have similar numbers. They probably have similar numbers in terms of course choices for their students. But are those four grades of sectarian religious courses from grades nine through 12 in the high school worth the extra 50 to 84 non-sectarian courses they could have if we didn't have that religious divide, if we didn't divide those kids into two separate school boards, a sectarian school board and a truly public school board? I think clearly not. And I think if you explain this to parents in a community like Renfrew, explain this to the Catholic parents that you know, because most of them are not church going, probably 90% of Ontario Catholics don't go to church regularly. So if you explain to them that this is the cost of those four courses in religion that your kids have to take from grade nine to 12, it's costing them an extra 53 to 84 courses in choice that they could have. <clears throat> so, you know, it's one thing if Catholic parents see this, see a slide like this and say, well, I'm okay with that. You know, the religious course is very important to me. But, you know, having this divide in Ontario school system, uh, you know, most of the students in Ontario, 70% of the students are not Catholic, you know, and giving the Catholic parents the choice of foregoing all this extra academic choice, it's not just for them that that decision is being made. And when politicians are making the choice to stay with the status quo, they're not making the decision just for the Catholic parents, you know, they're making it for all parents that, none of you are going to get this extra choice that you could have. This is a huge opportunity cost of our, our status quo. So another consequence of a split is when you divide the kids in a school or in a community, uh, you, you're often dividing them to the point where you cannot have a full grade two class or grade three class or, you know, so you end up with splits. And in small Ontario communities like Mattawa, Ontario, which again is west of Ottawa, as one example I know of, is they have triple grade classes. And I've heard the same happens on some of the islands near Kingston, Ontario, where you've got multiple grades to a class. And this has many, many consequences. And I'll go into them in my next slide here, is less individual time and attention from the teacher, less access to the teacher who divides their teaching time between two grades, less time for the teacher to teach the curriculum for each grade, um, more seat work rather than interactive learning while another grade is being taught in the same room, more homework, more distractions, and the students must be more independent and self-motivated. Um, all of these points that I show you here and the consequences of splits, which arise far more in a school system like ours, where we divide um, our communities along religious lines, uh, this came from a slide prepared by the Ontario English Catholic teachers. So they can't refute any of this, they wrote it. Um, but, uh, you know, an example of how this might increase the workload for the teacher, with, which is detrimental to the, uh, to the students, is a teacher of a combined grade seven and eight class must cover 601 expectations for grade seven in the curriculum, as well as 603 expectations for grade eight. That means they're responsible for teaching 1,204 expectations each school year, whereas a teacher of one grade is responsible for teaching half that many. That's a lot to juggle for the teacher. They don't like split grades. And this is why the Ontario Catholic teachers wrote this pamphlet that brought up these points that pointed out the, uh, the disadvantages of splits. But the irony is, is the Ontario Catholic Teachers Union, who is so opposed to the idea of one school system, uh, doesn't acknowledge that, you know, a lot of these problems uh, that they bring up with splits only come up because splits are so common because we divide our school system. <clears throat> This is another slide I just threw in today because it's something I was actually thinking of writing politicians about uh, during the pandemic. You know, this isn't gonna be a lasting impact, but it is one right now. Is as I alluded to with my own experience and my own kids experience of riding a bus for 80 minutes a day to a, a distant community to go to school is every time that's been happening in the past year is an opportunity to transplant coronavirus between communities. This is, um, uh, it's just a, you know, it's not going to be a lasting impact, but it is a, it is a current impact that uh, we've seen in the past year is, uh, you know, students have been working from home a lot more. There've been lockdowns where students aren't going to school at all, but when they are going to school, every time they take a bus outside of their own community, which is something we're all being discouraged from doing, is there's a chance of transporting coronavirus uh, either way. <clears throat> 
So I alluded to this uh, earlier is, you know, we hear sometimes that uh, the Kowski system is better, but, you know, are they better or are they just different? You know, um, the OECD did a study in, in the UK a few years ago where they have um, basically what John Terry proposed in 2007, they have many religious school groups. And they found that results are a function of intake. And by intake, I mean socioeconomic intake. So those are the biggest factors. And, you know, in my case, when my kids had any sort of trouble is if I could afford with a, a decent job to pay $50 an hour for a tutor to help them over whatever hurdles they were facing. Uh, lower income families can't do that. So, you know, and if you, um, if you look at census data, and this is from the census, this last bullet on this slide, is as a group, Ontario Catholics suffer lower unemployment, enjoy a higher level of educational attainment, that's college, university, high school, than the population in general. Uh, so it would suggest that they have a socioeconomic advantage uh, that may explain the one or two points difference that you see on the standardized testing data every year. Uh, but that could also be explained too by these contextual factors that seem to go largely ignored that show that the truly public school boards in Ontario bear a disproportionately large share of the burden in, in integrating uh, newcomers to Ontario. <clears throat> and here's some of the specific factors from those uh, EQAO data. Uh, fewer English language learners, special needs children, children born outside of Canada or whose first language not English. And of course, I've seen this in my own community and it happens in other communities is Catholic schools are, are very often less crowded than the public schools due to their right to refuse 70% of the population. It's 70% of the population now. I think the first time I wrote the slide in the 2016 um, election or 2016 census, uh, it shows that uh, uh, non-Catholics are now 70% of the population in Ontario. So politically, where do we stand now? Uh, well, for years, the Green Party has supported one school system. Uh, it, they, their support for it was, was considerably quieter in the last election than in previous elections, uh, but they are currently the only party that supports it. Um, you know, there, there's plenty of support as my previous slide showed though in all political parties, all major parties. Um, and, and Alvin, who's speaking after me, he's um, uh, ran for the lead, leadership of the Liberal Party. He, he uh, supported the idea. So he's evidence too, and as I am, I'm a liberal as well, that um, uh, you know, there is support in the political parties uh, for this idea. But, uh, you know, we have a massive cost, opportunity cost of debt service in Ontario. Our debt is approaching $400 billion in Ontario. It's probably accelerated because of the pandemic. Um, and if interest rates rise, there's a, there's a significant risk of interest rates rising from historic lows, is our debt servicing costs could quickly become unsustainable. Uh, or, or very burdensome, and that would negatively affect all programs, including education. So to me, for many years, I've tr been trying to argue, and, and I think, you know, objectively, it's hard to counter uh, that the divisions in our school system should be considered very low hanging fruit in terms of waste that can be harvested and, and corrected in, in, in the Ontario economy. Uh, I do have some hope, though, that, you know, it's, it's, uh, if I see silver lining in the, in the huge debt and debt servicing that Ontario is facing, it's that those deteriorating physical conditions may eventually force the Ontario government to grapple with this issue. Um, yeah, but, uh, but it, it's, it's somewhat important that we grapple with it too before. What I'm worried about is after this election, if the government does, like the Liberal government that preceded them, decide to force um, school boards to rationalize their very costly overcapacity, but they don't merge the school systems at the same time, we're going to see what we've already seen is we're gonna see uh, communities where kids are forced to endure longer bus rides to more distant schools, and some schools are going to lose their schools altogether. Some communities are gonna lose their schools altogether because they simply won't have the critical mass to support a school divided into uh, you know, a Catholic school and a, and a public school where they could very well have a viable school if kids weren't divided in that way. So uh, that's what the end of my presentation. I do want to mention, though, is um, uh, there are other groups in, in Ontario, too, that are pushing for one school system. Uh, one is civil rights and public education in um, Pembroke, Ontario, um, headed by Renton Patterson, who's been at this for many, many years, since the 1980s, when full funding came about. 
Um, they are part of a group called Open that is uh, trying to mount a legal challenge. They're, they're doing fundraising through the, uh, for that through through a donation mechanism. You can go to this website or you can Google Open and Cripe Web and, and uh, support them if you want to. Is uh, uh, They are a group that currently has an initiative to try and uh, push for change through legal means. Um, but, um, and, and here they're, um, one of the things I think they're going to argue is that the constitutional bargain giving Ontario Catholic separate schools was broken with the rescinding of denominational school rights in Quebec. So this may be even an avenue for a challenge as well. Just I want to leave you with a couple of quotes here and then I'll pass it on to Renton. Uh, uh, this is the sort of thing we've heard from politicians over the years is, uh, you know, um, the more recent one was actually a, about uh, Alvin's leadership, you know, leadership uh, uh, candidacy. Uh, the education minister of Ontario said it's a constitutionally a uh, protected system that benefits millions of youngsters. Well, he's wrong there is, uh, you know, it's about 600,000 kids, not millions that are in the Catholic school system. And the divisions in our school system, uh, while some Catholic parents may perceive that as a benefit, you know, the minority of Catholic parents, very tiny minority that actually goes to church on a regular basis, uh, it has big consequences, as I've alluded to in this presentation for everyone, including Catholic kids, you know, in terms of choice, in terms of having to endure longer bus rides. Um, so this is, um, it, sh it should be known too, that, you know, Mr. Lecce himself was uh, was an alumni of Catholic schools and you know, it mentions it right here, attended private and public Catholic schools. But the second quote is uh, a sort of thing that, that can be quite disheartening to hear is, uh, you know, Kathleen Wynne, um, when she made this quote, you can read it for yourself, it was basically suggesting that, uh, you know, she puts uniquely Catholic educational school rights in, ahead of fundamental equality rights for everyone else. And that not only uh, she believes that, but she says that no liberal government is ever gonna touch this either. And, uh, you know, she was the Minister of Education at the time, but I thought it was quite arrogant to suggest that uh, she, that she would think that she would speak for not only herself, but for all liberals forevermore um, was, was quite a striking statement. Anyway, that's, uh, that's it for me. Um, I uh, look forward to any questions you might have after Alvin's uh, presentation. I, I hope it was informative. Uh, I'm going to pass a copy of this presentation to Anna afterwards and uh, I had to cut it down quite a bit. There's a, there is speaking notes in it that you may find in informational as well. If you're interested in learning more about the issue, maybe some of the, uh, the legislation that brought Catholic schools into being in the 1800s. But uh, that, that's it for me for now. And I'm going to pass it on now to uh, back to Anna to, and to Alvin. Thanks. Thanks much, Leonard. Uh, just a reminder that if you have any questions, about the presentation, please type them in the Q&A box instead of the chat. It's just easier to keep track of the questions that way. Thanks again, Leonard, and uh, over to you, Alvin. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Leonard. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, my name is Alvin Tejo. Uh, I am a uh, former pol pol politician, uh, maybe current, according to some. Um, but I'm uh, here to talk to you today, obviously, about uh, this very important issue. And um, what we're going to do just sort of quickly uh, is I'll just do a quick introduction to myself. I'm a father of three. You can see there's a picture there of my three kids. Um, and that's my wife, Rebecca. She's a nurse at Sick Kids, And uh, my kids are six, eight, and 10. And uh, so they're very much actively part of the system right now and are, if this may or may not surprise you, they are in a French Catholic school uh, right now here in, uh, in Mississauga where we live. And I've worked in post-secondary education and education uh, the majority of my career, about 12, 15 years, uh, mostly in post-secondary education um, at Ryerson University, also at Sheridan College. Uh, I went to Queen's University myself uh, for my undergrad and I went to Harvard University for uh, my master's degree. And my focus has always been in and around education because of how important this system is uh, to Ontarians, right? Our competitive advantage as a province, uh, we've determined through government studies and, and third party studies, is generally due to the fact that we have one of the highest educated uh, populations uh, in the world. 
A lot of that is because of uh, the immigration system that we have and the points that you need and, and ha having uh, people come in who have uh, advanced degrees and things like that. But also it's the importance that we put as a society on our education. We have very high uh, graduation rates uh, in high school. We have the highest post-secondary attainment rate for colleges and universities in the OECD. That's the Organization of Economic Development uh, across the world. And uh, we, we obviously value um, education very highly here as a province. I led the paternity leave change. I've been working in, um, in advocacy uh, for a long time. I was an advocate as well for uh, basic income and for uh, childcare expansion when I was running. And I did run as a liberal candidate in the last election in 2018 in the riding of Oakville, North Burlington. Um, and I also ran to replace Kathleen Wynne as a leadership candidate in 2020. And uh, I didn't win that election. Stephen Del Duca is our our leader now provincially, um, but I've committed to you know friends and family and supporters um, like Leonard, like uh, Richard, who I see is on this call, uh, Rick, who I see is on this call as well, uh, that I'll keep fighting for this um, as we move forward. The issue is, is that as, as Leonard raised, there is a lot of uh, hesitation around um, political parties and candidates running on this particular issue as uh, many people sort of view it as the third rail. Um, but you do have the Green Party of, of Ontario who, who actively act, uh, advocates for this. You also have um, candidates and people within each party uh, who support this. Obviously, John Tory supported a different version of it. Um, for those of you who might know, Michael Pru, uh, he ran for leadership of the NDP. He lost to Andrea Horvath. He also proposed this amongst the NDP. Um, and the big pushback is obviously has been through um, some of the unions. Uh, I'm going to play a quick video here, and I know not everybody on this call is a liberal. Just sort of keep your uh, sort of um, mind to the fact that this was created for uh, that audience. But obviously, we're here talking in a, in a fairly nonpartisan way about this particular issue. The question of defunding separate schools is one that more than half of Ontarians polled want to see put to rest. I absolutely think that we should have one publicly funded system. Currently in Canada, only Ontario, Saskatchewan, and Alberta fund both the public and Catholic systems. But other provinces, such as Newfoundland and Quebec, they stopped years ago after passing constitutional amendments. It does not meet the standards of 21st century constitutionalism. Those public schools should be available to everyone. Doing what's right isn't always easy but it's necessary and it's who we are as Liberals. Ontario's education system needs a refresh. Its funding formula is decades old. We waste millions of dollars and countless of hours of class time on standardized testing, and we spend over a billion dollars a year to maintain religious divides of the past. It's time for us to be brave and make a change that will benefit every student in this province. Right now in Ontario, when we send our kids to school, we separate them based on their religion and it's expensive. By merging the Catholic and non-Catholic systems, we could reinvest $1.6 billion in savings back into our education system every year. That could pay for smaller class sizes and specialty classes like STEM and arts. We could have more support for students with special needs and more resources for teachers and early childhood educators. But more than that, the status quo is also fundamentally unfair. In many parts of Ontario, if you're the wrong religion, you can't go to the publicly funded school across the street. For students, that can mean over an hour, a day, every day, on a bus, to go to a school outside of their community. The status quo also discriminates against educators, preventing passionate and qualified teachers from working in their communities based on their religion. It's time to stop ignoring the elephant in the classroom. It's time for change. Ontarians support merging the school systems by more than two to one. If we've learned the lesson of the last election, if we're listening now, then we need to take that seriously. It's time for us to move beyond religious divides of the past. It's time for us to have our kids learning together. So actually that voiceover is my wife's, um, but uh, that's the video we played uh, at, the, uh, at the convention um, for the leadership uh, last year. Um, we did talk about the plan quite a bit, but uh, I want to sort of talk about our proposal that we um, were uh, advocating for when we made the announcement. Um, and as, as Leonard mentioned, I was the first um, 
leadership candidate in the history of the Ontario Liberal Party who has ever proposed merging the school boards. Um, and that might be surprising to some because the Ontario Liberal Party, the history of it was founded on Catholics and farmers in southwestern Ontario. So that is at the root of a lot of, uh, of the party support. But uh, what we proposed was uh, using the current 72 school boards that exist. Uh, there's 31 English public boards, 29 Catholic boards that are in English, merging those together um, to create 31 merged English public boards. We would take the French boards and merge those together. And since the French Catholic boards are larger, um, the French public boards would be absorbed by the French Catholic boards. Um, then we would have a total of eight merge uh, French public boards. There are over 2 million students in Ontario from the K-12 system. Um, about just over a quarter of that, 685,000, are in the Catholic school system. So even though the boards look like they're about equal in number, uh, the number of students they actually serve is not. Um, you can see that right now from what um, Leonard was talking about is that as a student, you cannot attend a publicly funded school based on your um, French language rights or your Catholic rights. So our proposal was opening it up so that any student could attend any school. And I wanna go into the rights piece a little bit more because the Catholic rights exist for elementary schools completely. So if you have students um, like the age of my kids who are uh, six, eight and 10, they absolutely, if they weren't Catholic, they cannot attend a Catholic school. They did open it up a few years ago for high schools to allow non-Catholic students, but there is still a preference made to Catholic students, obviously. And if there's a waiting list, that waiting list will be filled first by Catholic students over non-Catholic students. The second piece I wanna talk about here is about qualified educators. And we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but you have to be Catholic in order to work at a Catholic school, not just as a teacher, but as an educational support worker, as uh, a librarian, um, as a janitor, right? Like you need to be able to prove your Catholicism. And what that means in practice, it means that you have to go to a priest somewhere uh, at a church nearby and talk to this priest and say that you are applying to a job at a Catholic school and you need their letter. You need their letter stating that you are Catholic that you've been baptized, uh, you are part of the system, um, and then you take that letter and you attach it to your application. So, you know, a lot of people have a problem with this because nowhere else do we have publicly funded jobs that require a religious test for you to work in that job. The other issue is that there are school boards who take this rule very literally and will not hire non-Catholics um, to fill spaces that may be vacant. And they will intentionally hire a Catholic who is unqualified over a Catholic who, over a non-Catholic who is qualified. So that is obviously a, a, another big issue here. Um, so our proposal obviously would mean that any educator could work uh, at any school. The savings. So, you know, there was a study done a few years ago by the Federation of Urban Neighborhoods. They're the ones who said uh, that there could be up to $1.6 billion in annual savings, uh, which is quite a bit of money considering the system um, is, uh, is always strapped for cash. Um, the billion dollar estimate uh, done by the uh, Ministry of Education themselves is usually where we think the low bar is in terms of the minimum amount that we would be able to, to save here. A lot of that comes from the duplication of governance with school boards, having multiple school boards, trustees, directors of education, things like that. A huge chunk of it would come from transportation. You know, transportation is a multi-billion dollar piece of the education budget to begin with. And if you're able to uh, coordinate that better and have kids dropped off at the closest schools and things like that, and not having to pass other schools in order to get there, then that would make a huge difference. And capital, right? We would be able to have um, schools uh, there. We would be able to uh, increase um, the renovations and things like that and keep certain schools uh, up to date and other smaller schools might close, but you would have more schools in those communities overall. So my proposal was that we would take that $1.6 billion and reinvest it in the classroom, specifically to hire more teachers, to have smaller class sizes, 
to offer things like special ed, uh, more courses in STEM uh, and in the arts. Uh, and we could also obviously use it for, for upgrades as a, a number of the schools in Ontario have um, deferred maintenance costs. It's better for communities in a number of ways. It keeps schools open in smaller communities by merging them together, shorter commutes for families, obviously, and uh, schools can operate more as a neighborhood hub. There's, again, obviously more opportunities for teachers and education workers as they'll be able to work at any public school as opposed to just the ones that they're qualified to work for. I want to walk through some of the polling because um, when I made my proposal, there were a number of polls that came out um, the, in the days and weeks after uh, we announced it. Um, this one was done by Abacus Data, and I will tell you that the sample size over all these polls uh, is into the thousands because of how many were done. Um, and so the, the data is fairly consistent across most of the polls. They all show a majority of support uh, in Ontario um, to change the system. And you can see here, uh, it's over two to one. Um, there's a good breakdown here where you can see, uh, you know, on the overall based on income, based on age. Um, it's an interesting thing on the age piece because a lot of those people have been in around Ontario longer and have heard this discussion for a long time and um, can understand the benefits and the need for change. Um, what I find really interesting is this number down here, which shows you um, that 25% of Catholics strongly oppose merging the boards together. So that means to me that only one in four Catholics strongly oppose merging the system. And so they may not favor it or they might be unsure, but this is, you know, this is a very interesting number to me in terms of, um, you know, who are we doing this for and why. Um, this breaks down um, by uh, political affiliation and uh, region as well. You'll see that um, uh, every political party uh, has support for this, a majority of support for this. It doesn't matter if you're left, right, or center, you understand that there's a number of benefits for this. Some of the other polls that came out, um, one was done by the Toronto Sun, another one done by Ipsos, um, all showing a majority of people supporting this. The uh, Sun poll had up to 71%. So. Um, and these are more current. This happened within a week of um, my announcement for this uh, proposal. A lot of people talk about public appetite. What is the public appetite to do this? Why haven't we done it already? Um, people are certainly interested in this story, right? People kept talking about it. It was the number one story in the star um, when we published it. It was trending on Reddit and on Twitter. Our website had um, over half a million visits after we made this announcement. Uh, and the majority of our, uh, you know, signups and interest in our campaign uh, were because of the one school system. So, you know, I think that's it's certainly part of the conversation that keeps going, and um, it's our job to keep it up. So, one of the other things I want to mention is that this, I don't find this proposal to be anti-religion. I actually find it the opposite, right? I said at the beginning. Uh, my wife and I are both Catholic. We got married in the Catholic church. Our kids attend a Catholic school. Um, they attend a French Catholic school because my wife has French language rights. But that means our family has four times the amount of choice. We could go to any school that exists in this province. But there are very few people who fall into that category. And we think it's inequitable. And we understand that the benefits of diversity in this province, right? We talk about it a lot. We talk about how we're the most diverse and how great is it that we have people coming from all over the place with different backgrounds and contributing to our, our schools and our businesses and our economy. Um, yet we still have this separate school system. How could we help and uh, improve that uh, through the school system? Well, if we had one school system, one of the things we do right now in the Catholic system and this was a question somebody put into the Q&A, is that we have to learn religion, right? So in high school and in elementary school, you'll always have to have one of your periods dedicated to the study of religion. Now it says religion, but it's really Catholicism. With the one exception of grade 11, where you get to take a world religions course um, as part of your religion for that year. And that's the first time that any uh, Catholic student in a Catholic school will be exposed uh, to other world religions. And that's a fascinating course, and we learned so many things. And I think that's something we would want offered as an elective for all students 
um, regardless of their background, right? If we had one school system, we could offer world religions as a course. We could even break it down to the six major religions and have individual electives for each of those, right? There's certainly possibilities to, to offer those types of courses if you have larger schools with more course, course offerings available. Constitutional amendments was another question that somebody raised. And so um, three of the other provinces have um, changed it. Uh, more recently, Quebec and uh, Newfoundland have changed it. When it only affects a single province, it only requires that province's legislature to pass uh, a bill, an amendment bill, uh, through that provincial legislature. So you need a majority in that legislature to approve a bill that would merge the school system. That bill would then go to the federal government where um, both houses uh, would have to pass the bill. And in no case in Canada, and it's happened about 11 times, has a, a, a provincial amendment been denied by the federal government, uh, by the Senate or the House of Commons, including the Quebec Act and the Newfoundland Act, which uh, merged the school boards. So Quebec is doing the same thing that I was proposing, which is uh, replacing all the denominational school boards with uh, an English one and a French one. So they run as English and French. The interesting thing in, in Newfoundland was that they actually had up to six uh, different school boards because any Christian church could open a school and get publicly funded. And they had at the time when they merged the system in 1998, uh, six different publicly funded school boards uh, across Newfoundland and Labrador for different uh, Christian denominations. So now they run uh, a single uh, uh, English public board. Um, so I'm not sure there's any other questions about that, but this is another sort of quick video that sort of happened in the last election. My plan to merge the Catholic and non-Catholic school boards is all about making education better in Ontario. It would take the best of both systems and make it available to everyone, regardless of their faith or where they live. It would mean smaller class sizes, more resources for teachers, more supports for students with special needs, and more course offerings. It would also mean more choice for students by giving every Ontario student access to optional religious education. My plan is about students and making our education system work better for them. But we can't do it without you. Join us in creating an education system that helps our kids learn together. Go to vote.alvintejo.ca to get involved. So I'm not currently running anymore, so that's not a, a useful link. Um, I just want to answer some of these questions that have come up, um, but uh, also wanted to talk about next steps. Um, you know join uh, an advocacy organization like Leonard's uh, to, to try and keep this up. And political parties uh, need to keep talking about it, right? Your friends, families, and neighbors, education workers, they need to understand the potential benefits and things like that. So um, I do want to address some of these issues here that have come up, although maybe I will end this. And if anybody wants to reach me directly, you can take that information down there. Uh, you can send me an email, you can at me on Twitter or Instagram. Uh, or on Facebook, and you can also text me if you want on my cell phone right there. So I will share that in the chat if uh, anyone is interested, but uh, I see a lot of questions here in the Q&A that I want to get to as well. So I will stop my share there. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, a lot of questions indeed. I'd like to start with a question that actually uh, came in over email. Um, and uh, it says there are actually more than two school systems. Mm. There are the seven remaining schools that fall under federal control, five of which are located at Six Nations. It's a scenario whereby the control of the schools rests with the Canadian government. However, curriculum is determined by the province. The teachers must be certified by the province. Mm. This means that complaints against schools and staff flow up to the Minister of Indigenous Services Canada and potentially to the Ontario College of Teachers, if you would like to address that question. Yeah, so that wouldn't change, uh, I think, under anyone's proposal. Um, Leonard, I don't know if you have something to add to that. Uh, I don't know really anything about Indigenous schools in Ontario. I didn't realize that there were some under federal control, but 
uh, I wouldn't see them as relevant to our conversation here today if that's the case. Like, are any of them religious? Like, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, we're seeking a, a merger of the uh, Ontario publicly funded um, Catholic and public schools. Uh, so, you know, federal schools is a different topic. I didn't even know we had any, to be honest. <laughs> There, there is actually one other uh, school board publicly funded in Ontario. It is a Protestant school board for one single Protestant school that's been sort of grandfathered in. Uh, it's in Eastern Ontario that would be rolled up into this as well. Yeah, that, that one is provincially funded. That, that, yeah. They only have the one school. I think it's barely over 200 kids now. So yeah. it's almost a footnote in history. I don't know how it's managed to stay so many years. <laughs> okay, the next question is there was research last year which found that support for separate schools is relatively similar across all Ontario political parties. And it was suggested that this is one of the largest barriers to policy making. How can we as advocates seek to overcome this and elevate the issue of one school system to the forefront of political discourse. And uh, you spoke to that a little bit. And then the second question is, would a referendum on the issue be a productive step forward in your implementation? So, I mean, my answer to this is around the fact that the motivation for change um, has been pretty stagnant. Um, and I think Leonard would probably agree with this. One of the reasons that Quebec was able to move on this um, so decisively, despite having a significant Catholic population in Quebec, uh, was that it was part of the you know, secular reform movement within the province itself. There was a push um, throughout the entire province to do a number of things to make uh, Quebec society more secular. And the, you know, merging the school boards was one of them uh, that kind of got rolled up into that there isn't necessarily an impetus right now, uh, other than maybe the cost savings um, or the equity pieces until more of that becomes public. It's hard for it to, uh, to gain that type of momentum that you actually need uh, for the political change. I would suggest that one thing people can do if they wanna see the issue move forward is join political parties though, whatever, whatever your political leaning is. Cause I've been to, uh, um, conferences of all three political parties, all three, all four of them, all, the Green Party and the three big parties, and uh, support for our, the issue is strong. And as that slide I showed from the Vector Poll in 2017 showed, is uh, a significant majority of supporters in all of the political parties favor this proposal. They're well ahead of their leadership on this issue. So uh, uh, that leadership needs a push. And uh, if you want to help us uh, join your political party, whatever that your preference might be, uh, there are supporters of one school system in, in all political parties. When, you know, I'm, I'm a liberal now, I've been for the past 10 years, but when I was a Tory before that, I can tell you, I knew from experience there too, that there were supporters as high as uh, you know, vice presidents of the party who were quite strong supporters of the one school system idea. So uh, it's there in all parties and uh, please join your political party of choice and help us push this issue. A question from Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Would there be displacement of pupils from Catholic schools to private schools in case of uh, reform to a single school system if this campaign is successful? I don't think it would be a forced displacement, but there would be a displacement because, uh, you know, probably 90% of the families that use public funded Catholic schools do not go to church on a regular basis. But there is that 10% that that is uh, fairly um, uh, committed to their uh, their church. And I would expect that, you know, they, they would basically still, they would go to uh, private religious schools the same way people of non-Catholic faiths do if they have the means, but they would pay for it themselves, which is completely fair. You know, we expect that of uh, members of every other faith and every other sect of the Christian faith. So why should we not expect it of Catholic Ontarians? Okay, and uh, I saw that Alvin just posted his contact information in the chat. Thanks for that. And the next question, next question is from uh, Elka Catholic High School in Oakville, and I presume everywhere solicit non-Catholic students who are athletically outstanding, for example, in football. Don't know of female students, so sought. More of a quick question, I guess, if you'd like to comment. Yeah, I mean, that's also part of the problem, right, is that they can recruit students, all students. 
uh, in high school versus uh, public schools that can only recruit, uh, sorry, other way around. But yes, they are recruiting students because that uh, helps them with their funding. I think we can probably jump to the next one. Yeah, a question from Richard Thane. In Greg Sarbara's autobiography, the next big issue for our government to deal with in our modern Ontario is to move to one school system. Can you twist his arm and ask this respected retired Roman Catholic politician to become more active in this issue? Thanks. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, did, I did talk to Greg at, uh, at the convention. Um, I said, Greg, why didn't you do this on your way out? I mean, uh, Dalton McGinty was certainly a, um, a, a Catholic who had I think he was one of 10 kids and had a number, you know, he was very Catholic himself and um, he would never have done that. And uh, even though Greg was his finance minister, um, he was sort of, you know, barking up a hill there. But um, yeah, uh, Greg still supports it. A lot of, a lot of them support it after they leave politics. Um, I'm sure if you corner Kathleen Wynne after she leaves, um, she'll give you a, a very honest opinion. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of politicians will say uh, it's something that's very difficult to take on because the motivation of um, either Catholic parents or Catholic teachers who want to keep the system the way it is, is very high um, versus everyone else's somewhat malaise around uh, the issue. A question from Karen. Have there been any human, oops, it disappeared. Oh, uh, any human rights challenges made by teachers? Yes. Yeah. In fact, uh, one of the UN challenges was made by teachers, but it uh, didn't get very far. I can't, I can't remember what they said. Is uh, There's Renton, Renton Patterson's on the call. I know he's one of the attendees. He might be able to speak more to that, but there was a teacher by the name of uh, Jeff Prentice. I think his case was one of the ones that went to the UN and was dismissed. So there were, there were two condemnations that came into the UN, but there was another one that was unsuccessful. And I don't remember all the particulars about that. Uh, but basically what it boiled down to, I think, was that you haven't exhausted all domestic remedies because apparently you have to do that before you go to the UN. And in fact, he had, you know, it, it, there's no other way to move it forward in Ontario or in, in Canada. So uh, so it kind of dropped dead in its tracks. But the other one I alluded to in my presentation was uh, when full funding for Ontario CAS, uh, high schools was brought in in the 1980s, the Education Act provided that Catholic high schools would only be allowed to discriminate in favor of Catholic teachers for the first 10 years of full funding. And then after that, it was supposed to be open to all, right? So teachers of any faith would be able to apply. Uh, but in 1996, when that 10 year period expired, uh, the Ontario Catholic School Trustees Association instructed their member boards to ignore the law and continue discriminating in favor of Catholic teachers because they knew it wouldn't withstand constitutional scrutiny. The Harris government at the time took them to court, uh, lost, and in 1997, the courts basically affirmed that the religion of the teacher is the denominational aspect of employment that they are allowed to control under their constitutional rights, and that they could continue discriminating against teachers on the basis of faith, which they have continued to do. So ever since full funding came in for Catholic high schools in the 1980s, they've been discriminating in favor of Catholic teachers. It wasn't supposed to continue past the first 10 years, but it is. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Question from Patty. What are the major opposing forces for moving forward with the merge? This kind of uh, ties into the other question sort of further down about how powerful OECTA is in the Ontario Liberal Party or in general, um, because I think you have, I think there might be different supporters in different parties, um, but it's all roughly the same, right? So you might have more social conservatives in the conservative party who want to keep a religious funding system uh, in place. Uh, while with the NDP and the Liberal Party, you have OECTA, which is the Catholic Union, Teachers Union, who is a very strong force um, uh, in, of, of support. And, you know, I, I don't think either the Liberals or the NDP could win without teacher unions um, supporting them uh, in the election. So, you know, that is a very big obstacle to, to overcome. Um, that being said, they're not all unified. They are unified when it comes to bargaining with the provincial government. Um, but OSSTF, the Secondary School Teachers Federation, um, they've been in favor of this for a long time. ETFO, the Elementary Teachers Federation, they've been in favor of this a long time. In fact, I met with their chairs and their presidents and their lobbyists uh, during the last election campaign, and they were telling me 
you know, we can't publicly support you right now because we're uh, all together negotiating against the Ford government to try and, you know, prevent these strikes from happening. But here's all the material and research we've done. If any of this is helpful to you, then, you know, it's all publicly available, but, uh, you know, know that we're sort of quietly behind you, but uh, this is not something that uh, we can do right now because uh, OECTA is a significant force of, of people and resources. Um, and they represent a, a, a loud minority. Leonard, would you like to add to this? Uh, Any no, further comments? It pretty much uh, sums it up, I guess. Is uh, I think that uh, I honestly don't know why the issue can't move forward because uh, I think uh, Alvin's right is there's probably more social conservatives and religious conservatives in the Tory party who would be stronger against this than, but even that there, you know, you've got majority support for one school system. Um, I think that the issue provides an opportunity for any party that's willing to embrace it because it is a very polarizing issue. It is a very motivating issue, as we saw in the 2007 election. Uh, you know, when John Tory proposed further fragmenting the school system along religious lines, um, Dalton McGinty didn't have to propose what the majority of the population wanted, which was one school system. And plenty of polls that year in that election year showed that. Uh, he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to be brave and do that because uh, he knew that what John Tory was proposing was more unpalatable to the public than the status quo. So he only had to defend the status quo, you know, because what John Tory was proposing was, was less desirable than that. Um, had John Tory gone the other way, and I think if any party goes the other way, is I think he would also have, let's call it a very exciting election where you'd have motivated forces on, on all sides, but I think he would win. And I think if you made some of the arguments I, I made, because a lot of people, what I showed in my presentation, don't realize the consequences of one school system. They don't realize that the only reason their kid has to bus for, you know, ride a bus for an hour or two every day is because of the divisions in our school system. The only reason he's got to walk, you know, three kilometers to school instead of a kilometer is because of the divided school system. Uh, you know, the only reason he's only got 130 courses to choose from, whereas the kids in the city at the bigger high school get uh, 250 courses to choose from is because of the divided school system. And I think if you start explaining those things to parents, Catholic parents, that they would agree that that's a cost that is not worth bearing. Because remember, you know, probably fewer than 10% of the families going to to um, Ontario's publicly funded Catholic schools go to church on a regular basis. When OSSTF did a survey, when they first started looking into supporting one school system vocally, because most of their teachers have for a long time, uh, they found, I think it was only 14% of Catholic parents um, cited religion as their main reason for choosing Catholic schools. Uh, for most, it was other reasons. It was the neighborhood school, you know. So in my case, it's the only high school in the neighborhood. My kids ended up getting bused farther away. Uh, or they think it's the better school for some of the false reasons that I suggested earlier is that, you know, um, they may have higher standardized test scores, which I think fool a lot of people into thinking that it's a better school system. But there are social, social and economic reasons for that. You know, uh, if you look at the census data and the characteristics of the families that use the Catholic school systems, uh, that explains the differences. If you look at the contextual data that comes with the EQAO data that allow you to make an apples to apples uh, comparison, they explain the difference. Because if the Catholic system was truly a better school system, you know, I've said this to Catholic parents, then the discrimination whereby they can reject 70% of the population is even more reprehensible. You know, that, that they would get a better school system because of the color of their faith. You know, it's... Uh, that's what I would add to that, I guess, is I think this, this presents an opportunity for any party wishing to embrace it. Uh, I think it would be a very, let's say high emotion election campaign because uh, you know some of the people who would oppose the removal of this unique privilege uh, that, that only Catholic Ontarians possess would be very, very angry and emotional about it. But I wouldn't shy away from that because uh, you know as I explained to you guys before uh, we came on to this uh, webinar, is uh, I've debated, I actually enjoy debating the other side on this because there are no objective arguments, strong objective arguments in support of the status quo. So I would welcome the debate and I don't think any party uh, who sincerely believes this is the right thing to do, it is the right thing to do, should hesitate in taking it on. I think it's an opportunity that, that people don't appreciate. A uh, question from Jim. 
world religious course means world superstitions course. Uh, if you support the public system, if you value the public system, then support it. Shouldn't you put your kids there in that case? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, no, I mean, the answer is if the school was closer, that's the school we would go to. And in fact, you know, we're probably going to move our kids to a public school um, as they age up as those schools um, after elementary school uh, is closer. So, you know, to Leonard's point earlier, we want our kids to go to the best school that is close uh, to us. And uh, when our kids can walk to uh, the middle school or the high school around the corner, they'll be going to that school instead of the Catholic school. So, um, you know, it, it's convenience, right? For parents, we want our kids to go to a French school. We have um, that French language, right? And the closest French school as the French Catholic board is significantly larger than the French public board. Um, it turned out that uh, the closest school to us was a French Catholic school. Okay, from Isabel, given the apparent majority support and the current drastic increase in expenditures because of the pandemic, would this not be an optimum time for the government to move on this front? It would be great if Leonard's presentation could be shown to the Ontario legislature. legislature. It seems as if we need to get all four parties to agree on this issue and make it so, so that no one party suffers the loss of Catholic votes. I, I think if one of the major parties, the major, the big three parties took this issue on is the other parties would realize the untenable position they'd be in, in terms of trying to defend the status quo, they, they'd quickly come and realize that. And I think in, in the, uh, the NDP and the Liberal Party in particular, the support in the membership and in their supporters is already quite high for one school system. So I, I would say if if we were the first to move, you know, you could you can envision a scenario where the Tories might be the first to move to one school system on fiscal grounds, right? Because they're supposed to be fiscal conservatives, let's save money. Um, but I think they're largely driven by their, their social conservative wing right now. But um, the support for one school system is very strong in the NDP and the Liberals. I found that consistently over the years where I've been going to conventions for both. Uh, so I think if either one of them adopted this issue, they might force the other one to do so as well. Uh, because it would be uh, very hard to defend. <clears throat> so I think it be, could become a non-issue basically is, uh, you know, if, uh, if one party proposes it and the other parties realize that, well, I can't defend this, I'm gonna like propose it as well, then it's all of a sudden a non-issue, you know. So oh, never underestimate a party's willingness to win the next election by throwing other parties under the bus, so. I don't know. I, I think that's right. I think it's right that you would need everyone to support it and you'd need overwhelming support or you'd need um, some sort of thing that had happened that made everybody motivated to do this. Um, but I could easily see other parties sort of taking advantage of the fact that one party decided to go against this to try and get all the Catholic support. I mean, it is 31% of the population, despite only a quarter of them saying that they strongly support the system as it is. Yeah, I think we could win more of them, though, with some of the arguments we presented here today. I think, uh, you know, there hasn't been a concerted effort to change hearts and minds. Uh, but I think uh, we definitely have the arguments to do that if, if, uh, if they're brought to the fore in an election. So, um, so I'm, I'm not afraid of that debate. I, I would welcome it, and I think uh, any party should welcome it. Once they understand that the arguments in favor of change are so strong, I, what we presented here today I don't think a lot of people realize that. I don't think a lot of Ontario MPPs realize the full consequences of the divisions in our school system, uh, like in terms of choice at the high school level, right? For kids in both the Catholic and the non-Catholic system, uh, have they really tried to quantify, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of kids every day are bused further than they need to be? You know, have they considered the health implications of that in the pandemic, you know, of moving kids between communities and, and possibly transplanting viruses either way? Um, it's, uh, but, but physically too is uh, one thing that pandemics uh, um, brought to the fore is, is uh, Ontario's large debt and it's growing even faster now in the, uh, in the pandemic. So, you know, there will be physical pressures, particularly if interest rates start to rise. Uh, you know, if we want to uh, uh, preserve our programs and preserve the quality of our programs, we may have to consider this. I'm actually optimistic on that front as I think that that's going to happen, you know, that it's a silver lining to what is otherwise a bad, bad thing is the accumulation of, uh, of debt we're seeing, right, at a provincial level is that that's a threat to our programs. <clears throat> uh, thank you, note from, sorry, 
no go ahead and i was just gonna say we only have another 10 minutes so i kind of want to try to fly through some of these last oh, okay would you like to pick your favorite one uh well i can probably just answer some of them really quickly uh leslie asked uh how much money gets funded into the school systems um so just to answer generally very broadly speaking 31 billion dollars is spent on education um just over a third of that is the the catholic system so um, you're looking at probably 10 to 15, 10 to 12 billion dollars uh, on the Catholic system alone. Um, Kathy asked, uh, no Catholic students accepted in the Catholic system? No non-Catholics, I think is what you meant. Um, no, so there are non-Catholics who are admitted into the high school system, but there are no non-Catholics admitted into the elementary system. So um, depending on where you are, well, generally speaking, we're talking yeah, about K to eight. There are, there are some, some Catholic elementary schools that have significant non-Catholic populations, but the pattern I've seen over almost 20 years of pushing this issue is that it depends on the, uh, this, the status of declining enrollment in that area. So if you have, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned in the presentation, right. if you have seriously under-enrolled schools, is they are far more expensive to run on a per capita basis than a fully enrolled school. You know, schools run most efficiently when they're fully enrolled. You know, the school's not full of half empty space that you're heating and cooling. So this is what gives rise to those recruitment campaigns that spend money that, and you know, then there's counter campaigns that the coterminous boards will launch in, in opposition where they'll try to draw students away from each other is, is uh, you know, in order to reduce the per capita cost, which, which protects the quality of education for all their students, they'll try to draw enough students from coterminous boards to fill their own schools, but they spend money to do that. But if they succeed in doing that, they've transferred the problems that come with declining enrollment onto their neighboring boards. So it's a very unneighborly thing to do. And that, that goes on. So in areas of low enrollment in Ontario, where schools are seriously under capacity, you may find some Catholic schools that have fairly, elementary schools that have a fairly high number of non-Catholics uh, by and large, there's still like 90 some percent Catholic, probably province wide, right, at, at the elementary level. But you can find local situations where they've got a seriously under enrolled school and the trustees don't want to go through, take the political flack for closing that neighborhood Catholic school. So they'll try to siphon kids away from the other school systems in the area to make it more viable and, you know, reduce the per capita cost. So they're quite happy to take you know, his, uh, you know, he's the term holy enrollment grant, you know, um, non-Catholic kids are welcome in Catholic elementary schools when they, when they want the holy enrollment grant that comes with them. You know, yeah. It's, it, they're not welcoming non-Catholic kids because they want non-Catholic kids in the school system. They would prefer they not be there. But if it's the difference between having an expensive, seriously under-enrolled school or having a more cost-effective fully enrolled school, they'll bring them in for the grants that come with them. Yeah, um, but to answer your question, it, you, they do not have to accept them. It's a choice that they right. get to make and it, it totally depends on where, right? So I, I failed to mention this, but on one of my slides, I showed a picture of uh, Janet Gasparini, who is the former chair of the Catholic school board in Sudbury and the greater Sudbury area. The reason I put her picture there is because she endorsed me. She left um, the school board and said, it doesn't make sense that we have this much waste that exists, even though she was Catholic, even though she was the chair of the Catholic school board, she left the board, uh, she endorsed me in this plan. And she said, listen, when we're fighting over students in rural and Northern communities, we are not doing, we're not serving our students in the best way possible. And those school boards are the ones that often, you know, they won't share space um, they won't rent it out to uh, people who are not part of the community. Um, they're, you know, very protective of of uh, of where they are, and uh, and the type of school that they have. So, you know, it doesn't it doesn't help those communities at all. And that's where uh, merging the boards would have the most impact, especially in rural and northern Ontario. Okay, since um, Alvin, you have to dash. Maybe we can take one last question, Leonard. Is is there anything you'd like to uh, to address? Your favorite uh pick. Not really, but I mean, you know, Alvin brought up something there about, you know, support from a former uh, Catholic school board chair and, and uh, you know, talking about the arguments being uh, compelling and supportive of one school system and, and very hard to defend the status quo if you succeed in getting it into an open debate. And this is what I think any of the major political parties, if they did so, they, they, they'd be successful in that, is that uh, you can't defend the status quo. And, you know, as I mentioned to you guys before we started this, uh, the online portion of the seminar is... Uh, I, I research this issue online all the time and just see what people are saying about this issue. And, and one day I stumbled across a blog where um, 
uh, Ontario Catholic teacher uh, who was a member of the OECDA, the, the Catholic Teachers Union at one time, he was tasked with monitoring our group, keeping an eye on us. And apparently in the course of his job monitoring our group, he became convinced we were right. And he basically said this in this online blog. So, you know, it's like, uh, you know, there are plenty of people in the Catholic school system and, and you know, that may include trustees and may include teachers uh, that, uh, that, you know, given our arguments, they will support us. <clears throat> so I don't want to leave some of these questions hanging there just because uh, there are, some of them are important. I think some of the ones that you'll hear and John asked about what's the, what's the argument on the other side? Um, and some of them are, you know, you know, religious based or whatever it is, but I think we can get past some of those, uh, some of those points. Um, the ones around competition, I find interesting because some people think that having competing school boards is actually good for the boards themselves and for the schools themselves. Although you could argue we already have competition with the private system. Um, so that one's an interesting point that they make. Another one is around, uh, they love to use the example of the Toronto, um, uh, merger, the mega city. When you amalgamate uh, all these cities, you're still serving the same number of people. And therefore, there was really no cost savings when we turned uh, the mega city uh, into Toronto. Um, the argument against that is obviously like, <laughs> is, is different. Uh, I mean, they don't collaborate right now. They don't have you know, shared purchasing. Some places do. Some places like the city of Toronto, uh, TDSB and TDCSB do have um, shared resources, but a lot of these other places don't. Um, and this study that was made uh, by the um, uh, Federation of Urban Municipalities were talking about, you know, a lot of other communities outside of large urban centers where you can find these things. And then busing, obviously that's, you know, self-evident in terms of the busing piece. Can I speak to that point too? I hear that all the time too. Like, you know, and I, I dispute it. You know, some people say amalgamation didn't save money for cities. Why do you think it would for, for the school board? And, um, well, it's a completely different animal. For one thing, the municipalities that were merged were not geographically overlapping. They were geographically adjacent. They were unique territories. Uh, what we have in the school system is geographically overlapping territories. So, you know, if you want to think of something that, you know, a parallel to that is imagine you had... Uh, uh, a fire, like let's say you've got this religious divide, Catholics uh, are 30% of the population, non-Catholics are 70. So, you know, seven out of 10 houses on my street are going to be served by one fire department. Three out of 10 houses are going to be served by another. You know, that is ridiculous. That is waste. That is what we have in our school system. Uh, you cannot compare the two because, uh, you know, as I said, is uh, um, the, uh, the school system is merger that we're proposing is going to merge school systems that serve overlapping jurisdictions, not adjacent jurisdictions. That's right. Had with the municipal mergers. <clears throat> no, that's a good point, uh, Leonard, and it's one that, uh, you know, I was happy to make a number of times. Um, there's an, a question from Anonymous about um, where you can find the Catholic school curriculum. You can find it online. It is Googleable. Um, the only difference, the only difference that should exist is in the religion course that every student who attends a Catholic school has to take and has to be enrolled in. Um, so that course in itself is the only one, are the only ones that are supposed to be religious in nature. The other ones, science, uh, computer science, all those other things, math are supposed to be the same as it is in public schools. Now you will probably see, there are some examples of some teachers taking some liberties with that curriculum if they're Catholic um, and want to put some of their own lens, but they're not supposed to. Yeah, there, there is a uh, organization and I don't know who runs it, but uh, you know the Catholic education community has an as organization or institution of Catholic curriculum or something, and and you'll often hear them claim that Catholicism imbues the whole curriculum. But you know when I hear that, one of the responses I have to that is, if you're imbuing sectarian Catholicism into math or science, you're doing it wrong. If you're imbuing that into your health education and sex education, you're doing it wrong. You know, and I think a lot of Ontarians would agree with that. Is uh, I would agree with you, uh, Alvin. Is I think that it should be uh, restricted to you know their their um, uh, extracurricular activities, like they have their masses and things, and and they've got their uh, uh, their sectarian education courses where they're teaching kids preparation preparation for communion. Is you would expect those to be sectarian, but the other courses, like your your science courses, your math courses. Uh, they better not be, or, or there's a problem there, I would think. But uh, they claim that they imbue Catholicism in the whole curriculum. 
and I'm trying to, you know, there is a, I wish I had the name off the top of my head. Maybe someone else does and put it in the chat because I know that there's uh, some knowledgeable people like Renton uh, who are on the chat as well is if they remember what the name of that um, organization is that, that uh, promotes the, uh, or develops a Catholic curriculum, maybe they can post it in the chat. Um, and then there was a question around, yeah, Quebec was in a secular, secular movement, which is why they made their change. What was the impetus for Newfoundland and Labrador? The impetus was is that Newfoundland and Labrador was having a declining population and they couldn't manage to run multiple boards. And actually they were, they had even more boards before they started merging them, before they made the constitutional change before that. And so there, it was a financial and, and uh, resource based uh, decision that they had to make. Uh, they couldn't operate, you know, a dozen different types of denominations. Um, so they merged it and then they had to make a constitutional amendment to merge it even further and just have one system. Um, if there's majority support, even with many demographics, what's the barrier to government leaders? Should we have a province-wide referendum? Um, whether Would this be productive? Um, I think it's tricky to have a referendum without clear support from the government of the day or... Um, or a major political party. Because you'll see every time we've had a referendum in a province in Canada, whether it's British Columbia or Ontario um, or Quebec, you know, you'll know, you see that when the government doesn't take a position, especially on something like democratic reform, um, then you know the status quo tends to win out. Um, you need an active um, organization that will have the infrastructure like a political party or a government uh, in favor or against it one way or another and having a, a real campaign to discuss the ideas um, because otherwise you're just gonna, you know, you're just gonna have the status quo. My uh, opinion on a referendum is it's a bit of a cop out on the, on the side of the politicians, any politician that would do that. It's, they don't wanna engage in the debate. They don't wanna engage in the energy of the debate even though I think, you know, a very strong argument can be made for our position. So they basically just throw it to the electorate and says, uh, you decide, you know, and uh, I think the danger there, you know, I don't think it would happen in Ontario, but the danger is what would happen if that referendum failed, where you have 70% of Ontarians who believe that we should have one school system, and then because they weren't motivated to come up for the referendum, you know, uh, it failed. You know, I don't think that could happen with, with that kind of support, but it would be like right now we're discriminating by accident. We're discriminating because our school system that was never meant to favor Catholics at the start, you know, it was meant to keep warring factions or intolerant, mutually intolerant Protestants and Catholics apart in the 1800s. It evolved into a system which now clearly favors one sect of one faith, uh, Roman Catholics. Um, but it, it, it's, it's discriminating by accident, you know, it kind of evolved into that. It evolved from a system which was kind of fair at the time, you know, we gave it to Protestants, we gave it to Catholics. But now it's evolved into one that's very unfair. But if we have a referendum and somehow that referendum is lost, then now you're discriminating on purpose. And I think that's potentially socially explosive and dangerous. And I think that you know the arguments are so strong in favor of one school system and eliminating the waste and discrimination in our school system that is something that should be done just on moral grounds, just to eliminate the discrimination. Uh, we should not leave it to chance. You know, a government should be doing this because it's the right thing to do. You know. Um, yeah. The other side is not right. The other side is wrong. And we should be bold enough to say that, you know, that it's what we have in Ontario is wrong. It's morally wrong and we need to change it. Uh, I found the name of that organization. The, um, the organization in Ontario that develops Ontario Catholic curriculum is called the Institute for Catholic Education. The acronym is ICE. So their website is iceont.ca. And I posted it in the chat there. <clears throat> Uh, Moses raises a really good uh, comment around, you know, having a more integrated community, um, which is a huge plus, right? We, we want to see that governments are actually interested in that. They're trying to commit, they're trying to create more integrated hubs uh, in Ontario um, so that not everybody has to go to Toronto or whatever it is, right? So, you know, certainly that is another uh, positive that uh, this would create and should be another um, piece of our um, vernacular when we're talking about this, which is another piece that Spencer's talking about in terms of, you know, can we be more clear about uh, what we're talking about? Because it's not public board versus Catholic board because they're both publicly funded, right? We want one publicly funded system for everyone. And, you know, maybe it needs to be more taglined around end the discrimination or equal opportunity for everyone, whatever we feel the most, um, um, legitimate arguments are. 
uh, I think that's a, that's a good one to, to go with. Tanya sort of just threw in there, do Catholic schools have clergy on their payroll? Um, not necessarily, unless they're hired as chaplains. So there are chaplains at Catholic schools. I went to a Catholic school. Um, they have, they are teachers uh, and they are part of um, uh, the union and they do get paid. So it depends on who the school chooses to hire uh, to be the chaplain. I, I think some of them are, you know, sisters or brothers or potentially um, clergy. Um, mine weren't, but they were very, uh, they were obviously very religious. They took their um, masters in divinity or whatever it was. I can't remember exactly, but that, I don't know if you have good, anything else to that, Leonard. That's a good question because uh, I, I do know, uh, having looked on some Catholic church websites recently, that uh, quite often they'll list on their parish website the schools for which they have pastoral responsibility. So I think, uh, you know, and I've seen it on a number of these Catholic church websites where, uh, um, you know, it seems that different Catholic parishes in Ontario are uh, assigned pastoral responsibility for a different set of schools. So I think in Stittsville here, the community I live in, I think they say on their website that their church has pastoral responsibility for four schools. So I would imagine that means that that priest would travel to those four schools and do assemblies and things like that. <clears throat> but what, what he gets paid, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I wonder if he gets paid by that or they just do it because it's a, it's a good evangelical uh, activity for them to hopefully get those students to attend the church later. <clears throat> well, I remember we had like when I was in high school and I know they still exist now, like there are religious retreats, um, which are done at, um, you know, uh, other churches and, and religious retreats uh, off campus. So Spencer's got a good uh, suggestion here with N segregated schools as a, uh, as a, as a tagline, uh, which is, which is a good suggestion. Um, and I'm not sure about the, the Theodore case there, Leonard, and I think you're mostly focused on Ontario, right? So I'm not sure if uh, you'd play any other roles um, in Saskatchewan or other provinces. I'm in touch with them. That there, there is definitely interest out there, and uh, the one school system Facebook reflector has a number of people from those provinces, Saskatchewan and Alberta, that are on it. Um, in in Alberta, there's a, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. I think it's Dave King. He's a former education minister in Alberta. He's been kind of pushing the issue there, but I think he favors a referendum. But as I mentioned earlier, it's, I, I don't like the idea of a referendum for the for the reasons I stated, but uh, I believe that's what he's trying to push out there. <clears throat> Okay, we cleared it. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. You've answered all the questions. <laughs> and uh, thank you both for the informative presentation. That was great. And for tackling all the questions um, on the list. So, well, I want to uh, thank you and, and, uh, and Humanist Canada for uh, having this platform for, for Leonard and I to talk uh, about this very important issue. And, you know, I think both of us um, appreciate this opportunity to talk about this. And we do know a couple of people on this call, but, uh, you know, it's an important issue. And I encourage everybody to continue being involved and to uh, be persistent around this because we know it's the right thing to do. And history will, will judge us uh, correct at the end of the day. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to talk to you guys. And good to talk to you again, Alvin. And I hope uh, people got something out of this. And uh, I'll forward you my presentation as well if you want to share it with your members uh, uh, as a reference. Uh, it does have some additional information in the speaker's notes. Sounds good. Um, and just as we wrap up to mention that uh, we are supported by membership and donations. So if you'd like to contribute to our educational programs, including the webinars, you can do so on our website. And if you'd like to join us as a member, you can do so as well. And finally, our next webinar will take place next Sunday. You won't have to wait for, for a month, as always at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And our guest will be Kathleen Johnson, and she will revisit some of the pivotal moments and figures in Black history. And we'll also address the role of religion in framing the Black experience. Uh, you can find more information about that on our uh, website and social media as well. And again, thanks again, Leonard and Alvin, and uh, to our listeners as well for joining. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks.